The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to DIS2. Um, after we've talked a lot about um, systems both on the desktop and beyond the desktop, mobile and whatnot, um, we're going to take a look at all the other senses that we have and that don't really get used that much um, in everyday interactions and by most systems. So we're going to take a peek at speech, haptics, um, those kinds of non-visual interactions and or modalities that, that we also have available as humans. Um, so well, let's start with a, a, a brief explanation of um, what it means to think multimodal. And this is immediately going to ask you to participate. So um, I would like you to uh, give me a couple of examples um, of the senses that you have used. So your own senses that you've used, um, you know, recently when you've interacted with your computer. And I'm going to try to uh, share that as a, I'm going to take some notes while you guys are are giving me ideas. So just um, throw them in there, just unmute and um, and uh, shout some in and I'll, I'll try to keep, keep, uh, keep track. Uh, sound. Sound, okay. So uh, you've used, uh, can you give an example of what, uh, how you're using sound uh, as an output? Um, when there's like a, a warning tone or something uh, is not allowed, then there's always a sound that tells you that. Okay, good. So you're referring specifically to sounds that, that create like warning, uh, warnings, alerts, this kind of stuff. Good. Uh -huh. What else? Maybe also visual signals like warnings where you just get an exclamation mark that just okay. tells you, okay, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. So like an error dialogue that will pop up or something. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Haptic and touch. Uh, I mean, on MacBooks, you have the haptic feedback also when you use the mouse. For example, when you're moving things in a document. Uh huh. Okay. Um, very good. Okay. Anything else? It's also heat when you're losing, using a laptop. You can feel that it's working. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or whether it's working a little too much. Exactly. Especially in yeah. the summer. Mm -hmm. We're gradually approaching this. Anything else? What other senses do we have? Which ones are missing? Smell. Mm -hmm. So we're missing smell. Anybody ever use smell? Sense of smell connected to, to uh, using technology, your computer or something else? Google knows. There was an April, April, no. April Fool's joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but very, very every day. I mean, maybe not with your laptop, but uh, you know, if you had an, an old PC and uh, it was uh, heating up and maybe smelling of uh, the electronics running a little hot or something like that, or with other devices, of course, uh, we we may use that quite a bit, right? If you have a and a piece of electronics and it smells like uh, something's wrong. Um, then you know maybe you have a fault uh, in, in your system. Um, which one are we missing? What, what sense? Taste. Taste, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't lick my computer very often, so um, that is probably the least likely to use in interaction with technology. Although if you look at Kai, you know, there's more and more papers that actually try to simulate taste experiences for users. Um, we just had some this year and last year um, in order to 
you know, make people, for example, enjoy food more or eat less while they still feel like they're, they're satisfied. So there's, there's also a lot of stuff going on. Um, now, this is a great list. <clears throat> Let me go back to my, <coughs> uh, my other sharing. Stop this one. And let's go back to that one. Okay. All right, so uh, we have a lot of examples here. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, you, to point out a differentiation here to, to start with right from off the bat. Um, we have some things like, you know, what you said about seeing, um, you know, alerts on screen or hearing a beep that the computer creates that are synthetic, right? They are designed, they're made to appear. Somebody sat down and programmed that. Um, whereas you have other things like your computer running hot when it's doing a lot of work or I don't know about you, but you know, when, when laptops still had CD drives or, or DVD drives or even spinning hard drives, I would sometimes put my hand on the laptop to see whether something was still moving in there. Um, those are things where this is not designed per se, right? Nobody sat down and said, we have to make sure that our computer moves a bit and, and, and you know, vibrates a bit when the disk is running. Uh, it's just a side effect of what's going on. So it's a, it's a natural physical effect that uh, is almost unavoidable, right? Um, and um, so there is a distinction between um, signals that are designed to be there that are typically synthetic. So they, they wouldn't be there unless somebody actually sat down and created them like a beep from the computer. And then there's the computer's fan spinning, which is just something that is a side effect of the thing doing its normal operations. And we'll get back to this distinction um, in a little while. Um, we also have, in this case, only talked about what the computer generates or what technology generates and what we perceive. So we've talked about computer output, if you like, right? We haven't talked yet about the input that is made to the computer. So let's look at that uh, next. Um, if you try to imagine how the typical, what the typical input types on the computer are, um, especially if you think about like a traditional desktop um, computer, you know, as it was you know, pretty much common uh, technology up to the 90s, then you basically had very limited input modalities, right? You had a keyboard that you would type on and you had a mouse that you would click on. And those were the only things that you were providing to the computer. And conversely, what the computer was creating was almost all visual, right? Um, yeah, computers might have, you know, um, a speaker built in and to create a little bit of feedback noise. But people sitting down at their computer in the morning in the office would mostly just stare at the screen all day. So if you like, uh, this is sort of the picture that the computer has of us as, as humans. Um, traditionally, um, we basically seem to be people that have one finger because we can click a mouse button or tap a key. Uh, and we would have a big eye, obviously, to uh, watch what's going on on the screen. And apparently we have some ears because we can listen to alert sounds that the computer is playing or maybe some music that it's playing back. Uh, but that is very limited. And also what's, what's uh, created here is also showing like this, this finger is really big because that is the only input modality that we seem to have available to the computer. Right? Um, that was the only way we could create input. Now. Um, what that means is, in reality, there was you know, a living, real being in front of the computer all these decades, um, but the computer was only seeing a very small part of that. He was on, it was only able to detect a very small aspect of what people were actually doing in front of the machine. And that creates problems, because this is a super narrow channel. And we will be talking about communication channels here a bit um, every now and then. If you only have very few signals from the outside world, then you can only make very um, few predictions and very unrealistic or unreliable predictions about what is going on around you. For example, you know, in the age of the, of the desktop, people might have tried to, you know, developers have tried to develop code that would enable the computer to detect if the user was um, concentrated or focused or not. But the only thing they had was the keystrokes on the keyboard and the mouse movements. So they tried to build a model of, you know, oh, if people are 
like distracted, they might be typing, you know, maybe make more mis typing mistakes or something like this. And it's all very, um, you know, very honorable work, but a lot of it was really trying to interpret meaning into a data stream that was just not strong enough to support it reliably. Leading to, of course, a lot of problems, right? If you look at systems like the famous Clippy, uh, the paper clip that Microsoft Office had in the 90s, that would suddenly jump out in Microsoft Office at you and say, oh, it looks like you're writing a letter. Would you like some help? Those systems were quickly perceived as annoying by most people uh, since they were trying to make, um, to infer something about the user's state from very narrow data channels. Um, by the way, this picture is taken from uh, the book by Tom Igo, who uh, was one of the fathers of the Arduino board and, and his colleague, um, and the, the book's called Physical Computing. And it's a book that, um, you know, was built around this idea of letting uh, researchers build more you know, richer prototypes that would have a lot of sensors and would be able to detect a lot of things in their environment, light and moisture and humidity and, and temperature and so on and so on. And so it's not a surprise that that uh, Tom Igo also got involved in uh, in you know creating the Arduino as a board to detect all these things. Um, so we're talking about multimodal interfaces, and let's quickly explain what a modality is. A modality is basically a type of communication channel um, that you use to you know get information or to provide information. Um, to communicate how something is, is being done or, or to express an idea or to perceive an idea or a thought. Um, and when we say a multimodal system, then we mean a system that supports communicating with the user through multiple different modalities. And modalities in this case refer to our senses, right? Um, for example, um, the auditory modality or uh, a visual modality or the haptic modality. And in each of these channels, in these modes, we have different ways of, of communicating. For example, uh, the auditory modality, the computer can just beep at us, or it can create voice output, like you know, um, a voice assistant does. Um, or we can talk to the computer in that direction, it's also possible. Um, so each of these uh, modalities, these channels, has different variations of the kinds of signals that we send across them. And if you look at situations where you use multimodality, then what, we're, what we mean is situations in which we want to use multiple of these channels um, to create more effective communication. I'm talking about this at length here because it's easily confused with multimedia. You know, multimedia basically just means uh, we're using more than one medium and a medium is not the same as a, as a modality. Right? A medium is, for example, individual uh, modality, you know, things that we can see or that the computer can see if it has a camera, um, can include text, um, written text, you know, uh, or images, or, um, you know, there could be even a, a printed score of music. That's also a medium, uh, but it would be in the visual modality. Whereas if you play back that music, then you still have uh, the music as a medium, but it's now it's placed into the auditory modality. So it should be clear that uh, within each channel, if you like, we have different ways of providing um, information. And these different types are often called media, you know, this, um, you know, for example, animated uh, um, graphics or, or a running video or a still image. These are all visual channel informations, all in the visual modality, but different media. Now, why is multimodality so interesting? It sounds like you know, an awful lot of work to go through as a developer to, to build a system that can you know, understand voice or that can emit a realistic voice. So why, why bother? Um, <coughs> the thing is that um, our entire evolution has trained us to use our senses in combination. Um, so when you read a book, uh, you, you know, a computer scientist might easily reduce reading a book to uh, there is a string of letters being, you know, communicated from the system to the user. And sure, I can do that on a computer screen. But in fact, when we read, um, we also feel the pages of a traditional book in our hands. 
Um, you know, if you read a cheap dime novel, it feels differently than a heavy, high quality brochure or, or, a, or a dictionary that people would look at uh, or a historical book or a, you know, an old, uh, old tome from a library. Uh, and in fact, when you, when you flip over a page, um, you, don't, you don't just advance in the, in, you know, in the string of letters, but you're actually physically moving another page over to the left. So as you can continue reading, the left side gets thicker, the right side gets thinner. Any moment in time that you're holding a physical book, you know exactly without thinking about it, how far along in the book you are. And I don't know whether you've noticed this, but this is actually surprisingly tricky when you read books online or in an e-reader, right? Or on your tablet or your phone. Because uh, oftentimes you're like, well, wait, um, how far into this book am I right now? I don't know, right? And then you need to look at some marker on the side or it's not, and if, the, if it is available, then it's using the same visual modalities with overloading with the content that's already there. Uh, and that's why oftentimes you find, you know, ebook readers blending out this marker, thinking that it might not be important because it is conflicting with the contents itself and using the same, because it's using the same channel, the same mode, the visual one. Whereas here with the book, we're reading the letters, but we're feeling our progress, literally. Uh, we make haptic movements uh, to progress, to move forward. Um, and so these are all things that are going on. And you might even, you know, if you've ever taken a book from your grandparents and looked inside it, uh, old books also have a peculiar smell. Right? That's a, there's a musty smell that is created from the slow sort of degradation of paper fibers in a, in a book. Um, and, and that is actually uh, something that, you know, may also influence your reading of, of that book. So what I'm trying to say here is reading, for example, is easily reduced by computer scientists to this pure information processing from letters that we can probably capture all with ASCII or maybe Unicode if we're really adventurous uh, and that's it, but it, there's more going on. Uh, this becomes maybe even clearer for the question of interactivity when you think about an activity such as writing. When you write um, with a pen on paper, um, sure, you are putting down letters. So you might say, basically, you know, typing, writing, uh, what's the big difference? Um, but of course, there are some differences in just the freedom that you have, right? When you sketch on paper or on a digital uh, tablet, for that matter, you can you know, include a sketch or make little drawings and make annotations much more easily and fluently than you can on a keyboard. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the multimodal experience of writing. As you write on a piece of paper, um, you don't just see the letters appear, you also are paying attention to the pen that you are moving across it. Uh, you're looking at, there's an orientation of the pen uh, that you are aware of um, and you uh, you hear it glide across the paper. So there is an auditory feedback of writing when you write on paper. Um, and for example, when you write on a, uh, on a, on a tablet, uh, this is very different, right? Then the, the feeling is, is quite different that you have and the auditory feedback is also quite different. Uh, this is created by the friction um, of the surface that you're writing on. Um, and for example, good um, electronic white writing tablets for sketching or drawing uh, with digital pens try to create a surface that is more uh, like paper because the extreme sort of you know smoothness of a glass surface actually makes it hard to write reliably and not to you know slide too far when you're doing the sketch so that little friction that paper has is actually valuable um, and you know I don't even want to start talking about artists who totally rely on this to to do great sketches and drawings, they, they need this material feedback from, from, their, from their medium. Uh, and you know, you might even smell the ink that you're writing with when you're using an actual fountain pen. Um, so this again, creates a, a rich inter interaction. And some of these things are not just atmospheric, right? You know, you might say, well, smelling the ink or smelling the old book, that's nice, but it's, what is it telling me in terms of information? Well, the point is some of these things are really helping our cognitive brain process and, and, you know, the information and do the right thing. Like the haptic feedback is literally important for the, um, for the actual uh, activity of writing. And these other things um, still create a multimodal experience so that you may remember things better when you write, not just because you're moving your hand around, but maybe because you remember holding your old trusty notebook in your hand that you've used for three semesters 
um, and you know, sketch it in there, maybe do a little scribble on the side, um, and maybe it even has a particular smell. So these things help us remember um, and interact more effectively. And even if we interact with electronic media, right? Let's say you're looking at messaging on a smartphone, uh, you might say that's just you know letters going back and forth, um, but there's more going on, right? There's there's the the sensation of holding that phone in your hand. There is the potential haptic um, feedback that the phone may or may not give you when a message arrives, or may or may not give you when you press a key. Uh, that's why, for example, typing on on-screen keyboards is so hard, because we don't get the haptic feedback that we've actually pressed a particular key, and we cannot feel the key um, when we when we try to press it. So we're missing this, this channel in, in on-screen keyboards. All right, so um, it should be clear that you know, multimodal interactions are natural, right? Um, they are what, is, what we have been doing for millions of years, basically. So when we interact with the world around us, we always interact with all of our senses, or many of them. Um, all of them are turned on and switched on somehow, unless it's you know pitch black and you can't see a thing. Um, but um, yeah, in many situations, we actually really make intense use of many of these channels at the same time to make sense of a situation or to learn something or to communicate something. But for computers, this is hard, right? Every modality that we talk about, whether it's the computer trying to output it, like you know creating speech or creating sounds or creating haptic feedback, or whether it is, which is even harder creating and you know, detecting it as an input to the computer where it needs to understand speech or sense force input um, has to be implemented, has to be interpreted in the code and you have to make the right you know, semantics out of that. And this is why not surprisingly, when you look at computer systems, uh, even today, the overwhelming information channel in your computer is visual, yeah? So most of the stuff that the com your computer is trying to tell you is in the area of vision. Um, and this, is, this does make sense. I'm not saying that this is the wrong way to do it because um, our visual sense is the uh, highest bandwidth sense. Remember in DIS1, we talked about the bandwidth of different uh, channels of um, communication. And we, we found that vision was the one that could process the most you know, bits per second. So it's a very high bandwidth channel. So it makes sense to use it in, uh, by the computer as well. If you had a computer that you could only listen to, uh, that would be you know, a hard interaction indeed. You can try it out and turn on voiceover on, on your smartphone um, and, and see how that feels. And it's, you know, it's hard. And that's, of course, one of the challenges that people are facing um, who don't have perfect eyesight. Audio then is also something that uh, we see a decent amount in computers, um, not just for playing back music or, or, or things like that, or watching you know, videos, but also for control purposes. You know, the, the alert sounds that, we guys, that you guys mentioned earlier are an example of that. Um, haptics is used very little um, in computers as output. It's you know, it has gotten a little more prevalent with smartphones vibrating in your pocket and things like that, uh, and force feedback input devices that that you know talk back to you when you use them. But it's very narrow, um, and also, I mean, our haptic sense has a much lower resolution in bits per second than our audio or even video, visual sense. So the auditory and visual uh, senses are clearly you know more higher bandwidth. Um, but there are other senses, you know, like temperature or a smell or, or taste that, that aren't being used at all. Um, and yeah, I don't know about the you know, lickable user interface, whether that's a, an, um, it, it, that's a great goal, especially in the time of Corona. Uh, but you know, the senses are there and we're not, they're not being used much. We're actually seeing an interesting resurgence of this in VR. Uh, last couple of years at Kai, I saw more and more examples of people bringing extra senses, like for example, creating the sense of temperature um, in your VR goggles so that you could feel when you're walking through a desert or walking through a simulated you know, um, uh, polar area. People have tried to do this. And um, you may remember this from DIS-1 uh, when we looked at the um, historical sort of uh, user interfaces. Uh, what was the first system that we saw 
uh, that actually try to combine more than one modality. Anybody got an idea? When did we see multimodal um, user input being interpreted by the computer? Think back to the uh, the history videos that we watched. Yeah, Christoph, go ahead. I'm not entirely sure, but was it put that there where they combined pointing and speech? Exactly. Yeah, that was the one, the first one that we talked about, uh, and that became sort of well known for trying to make the computer understand multimodal input, right? I mean, we've always had computers beep at us. I mean, that has been around since the very first computing systems. Um, so you could say they've already been multimodal in their output, but this was an example where the computer was trying to detect multimodal user input, right? Combining gestures and speech. Um, and you may remember this was kind of awkward. You know, the, it didn't seem very, very natural yet, although, you know, it, there was a potential there. Um, and the, the problem, of course, is that it's really tricky to interpret all these multimodal streams, right? Um, and, and understand what is going on. But you know, this was this was an example. So when we look at multimodal systems, um, we can we can think about like, okay, what are the advantages of these systems um, when you when you go over the um, uh, when you look at the on, on the input side, right? We've got a couple advantages when you use multimodal um, channels for input. And when I say input, I mean um, input to the computer, right? So we're always, when we say input, we talk about input to the computer, output means output to the user. Um, we can easily use um, one modality when another one becomes unavailable. So, you know, if you've ever tried to use your smartphone in the winter when you're wearing thick gloves, then you're maybe happy to be able to, you know, use voice, for example, or when your hands are tied up or you're in the car and you can't look at your phone, um, all of a sudden voice is a great um, fallback, right? Um, this also increases accessibility, of course. It makes things more available for people with a wide variety of, um, of abilities and for a wide variety of situations. Um, remember, we mentioned this before, but I think this is, this is key. This is a key side message I want to get across. Um, people used to talk about, you know, building software or, or systems for dis disabled people. And a much better way to think about it is that um, everybody's disabled in some way all of the time because disability is a mixture of three things. What you can do physically, yourself, your body, you know, how good your eyes are, for example, or something like this, or how good your sense of touch is. Then what the current situation is that you're in, if it's the winter and you're wearing mittens, then you're essentially disabled through the wearing of, of, of your gloves. Um, and then there is how good or bad the technolo technology is. So technology can make you feel like a disabled person simply because it is making it really hard to use a particular modality. Um, so accessibility just means that providing multiple modes to act for access just makes the software easier to use, period, across the board. Um, when you use... Um, when you use modality in, in a mix, for example, you can also help prevent errors and increase robustness, right? So if a system detects things in multiple ways, um, for example, you might imagine a system that tries to detect speech and from, from your audio, what you say, but it might also look at your face and try to do some you know, AI-based lip reading and make sure that it understood you correctly. Um, that would be a way to make the input to the computer more reliable. In fact, we as humans, are amazingly good at this. Um, if you ever want to challenge yourself a bit, if you've got somebody that you can kind of understand, but not quite, maybe they speak with an accent or they speak a different language, try looking away and then try looking at their, at their mouth. You will immediately notice that you're much better understanding them when you see them. Um, in general, of course, multimodality can just also bring more bandwidth to the communication, right? So if you have a way of um, using voice commands while you're operating something in your hands and you can use both at the same time, it can make the communication faster and more efficient. 
But there's a, there's a caveat here. Um, if you build an application and you say, oh, it's multimodal because I need the user to you know, speak and gesture and I don't know, do other things at the same time, um, then you're maybe overloading the user. So that might be poor design. So you wanna make sure that you know, your system can work with input from one modality, but allowing the user to compensate if that modality isn't available or to provide more input to make the input more robust. Now on the, on the output side, it looks a bit similar, right? So we've got redundancy that is of course super useful. So a system that will um, just display an alert silently on your smartphone is useless because you're not looking at it all the time. Um, a system that only beeps or bings at you is also useless, but if you do both, then they work together and they give you uh, the right input, right? So you get synergy effects from these things. Um, you can, again, increase bandwidth by providing you know, output uh, across multiple modalities from the computer. And especially with virtual reality, you can increase realism significantly. And it doesn't have to be wearing, you know, head-mounted displays for that. Um, even if you just consider, um, you know, audio uh, output, for example, when you create audio output um, that is spatialized, so you know what is right and left, um, then you're adding more to something than if you just provide audio output that is simply just uh, in a standard stereo image. All right, so uh, let's do another little in-class exercise here. Um, and the idea is I have a, a little design space and I want you guys to come up with examples for each of these slots. So, um, let me explain what the design space is first. Uh, again, input refers to things going into the computer. Output refers to things coming out of the computer towards the user. Um, now you see the three um, primary modalities that we've talked about, visual, auditory, and haptic. And haptic. We're not gonna talk about smell and, and, uh, and taste. <coughs> and um, I've split them up into another thing here, control and data. What that means is, um, Whenever data flows between you and the computer or the other way around, um, it has one of two purposes primarily. It either is application data, so it is, it is information uh, that is part of the task that you're trying to complete with the computer. For example, um, if you have a visual interface, you know, uh, then the photos being displayed in a photo application, that's the contents basically. Uh, that would be uh, data flow. Um, and we also have some uh, information that is being provided by the computer or being given by us to the computer and as input um, that is for the interaction to control the interaction itself. So uh, an example might be you know the buttons next to your photo library. So um, let's look at these examples here um, and fill in these uh, uh, these different gaps. So I'm going to start. Uh, let's actually not start with visual input, although that's the leftmost, but that's a little trickier. Let's start with the visual output. I just gave you a few examples for visual output. So let's hear some more examples for visual output provided to, to give data to, um, to the user or to the, um, yeah, in this case, to the user, since we're talking about output. That was very simple. You guys can just... Um, Start shouting, we're not going to do blue hands. Pictures? Sure, pictures. Lists, tables. Lists, tables, absolutely. Uh, especially if, they, yeah, if they're displaying content from you know, the task of an app, like your shopping list or something like that. Yeah. So you get the idea, right? I mean, it's all the stuff. It's the text in an ebook that's being displayed. It's all that. Um, Control, uh, when does the computer use the visual channel to output um, control information to us? The buttons? Buttons, yes. Uh, buttons are an interesting one um, because they are, if you want, um, both an, an output, so they are rendered by the computer to create an output channel, uh, to create a channel, but and, and then we use it sort of to provide input to it um, by, by touching, but you're right. Uh, the button is being rendered by the computer. It's, it serves no application purpose. It's, it's a serve, it serves a control purpose. 
and it's using the visual channel because it appears on the screen. Absolutely. Other examples? Like a menu bar or taskbar? Yeah, and all the widgets, exactly. Yeah. In fact, all the widgets that we have are basically a control channel that the computer is creating visually. Uh, or if you have, you know, a device that has some status LEDs, like maybe, I don't know, your smartphone or something for charging or something like that, um, then this would also be an example of the visual output for control. Okay, so this is clear. Uh, let's move to visual input. Um, what are examples of creating data input? Um, so down here in the lower left, data input um, on the visual channel to the computer. Drawing. Yep, sure, absolutely. When you, uh, when you sketch, for example, um, that would be what would be an example of using the visual input, especially if you move, if you do the sketching in midair, right? If you are um, sketching on a, on a touch surface, then we could argue uh, the computer isn't seeing that in the sense of, a, of an, uh, an image. It's actually more like it's, it's feeling it, right? Because we're creating a physical impact on the, um, on the board, on the, on the drawing surface. Uh, what about image logging? When you use your face to log in? As yeah, so that's a good example. Um, face ID for logging in, for example, um, could be considered um, a control input because logging in is usually not sort of an application thing. Or you could consider if you're sitting in front of the camera and, and you know, making a, a selfie or something, then that would be providing visual input to the computer um, for data. Other examples? Just a recognition or like connect input? Yeah, so connect input is a good example. Although I would consider that more on the control side, um, depends on what you're doing, right? When you're using the, con the, the connect for, um, uh, when you're using a connect to provide input to a game, you're moving around, you could say that's application data. If, if you want to launch a game and you do your, you know, sort of little gesture, HoloLens gesture, for example, then that is more a control uh, input. Okay, so you get the same, you get this, you get the idea, right? Um, we could also consider you know, a fingerprint scanner, for example, in a, in a certain way also is looking at the user, you know, um, or when you, when you have a scanner, for example, and provide something. Um, but any raw video that you're feeding into a computer is, is basically visual data input. Uh, and visual in control input, uh, we already heard uh, the connect. Um, eye tracking is an interesting one. Eye tracking often comes up in this um, and people often confuse which way eye tracking goes. But eye tracking in the end means that um, the computer is looking at me and is tracking where I am looking. So by the fact that I am looking somewhere, I'm creating input to the computer. So it would be an input uh, technique on the visual channel um, and usually used for control, right? To move a cursor, for example. Now, auditory, you now gets in more interesting. Again, let's pick the easy one, uh, output data. What would you put there? Music. Yep, playing that music or um, when you are, you know, um, listening to a podcast, anything like that. Uh, and output um, for control information. So when does the computer output audio information for control purposes? Warnings and alerts. Yeah, whenever it beeps, you know, because there was a mistake or you got a new message, it goes bing, anything like that. Um, input, auditory data first, maybe. Voice recording. Yep. Yep, when you are recording your beautiful voice or whether you, when, even when you're dictating something, you know, like using a text, uh, uh, a speech recognition system to dictate some letters. Um, <clears throat> or when you're, you know, using a karaoke app and, you know, singing into that microphone. Um, control input, auditory to the computer. Voice commands. Yeah. yeah, anything where you use voices to, to trigger commands, right? Um, um, call Bob um, and your phone calls Bob, right? That's a typical example for a speech command. 
but also if you know you've got one of those annoying you know clap three times to turn on the lights you know that will be another example of using um, audio as an input channel um, and then we move to haptics um, haptics again uh, remember output means the computer is generating it and I'm feeling it uh, input means I'm generating some haptic input and computer is detecting it um, so let's hear some examples for um, haptic output data or control you just have to say what you think vibrating phone would be a control mm -hmm. when someone, so, someone is calling right exactly um, and and where you can already tell also that this is sort of the, the, the data control distinction isn't a hundred percent clear-cut right somebody might say well the phone is an application and the fact that somebody is calling me uh, is, isn't that just the application purpose? Um, I would argue that the, the true application data in the phone call is the actual voice data going back and forth between the two. And you know, establishing the call, alerting to the fact that there's a call, I would probably rather con consider as, as control input. Yeah, uh, output, sorry. Um, so when the phone vibrates to alert you. Um, got another example for haptic output for data specifically. There is an option to have a different vibration pattern for different persons. So this might be considered data, so you know who is calling you. Ah, That's interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when it when it's beginning to move into the data realm, right? Because it's giving you more and more application specific information. Yeah, good one. Um, but you know, you know how blind people can uh, can read text? Without you know using a voice uh, a voice reader, but using haptics. Live displays, right? So to any braille display that will poke up these little pins to to go over and and read. Um, that's a that's the haptic data output. Um, and for control, yeah, we said already, um, you know, for example, when, when I mute my iPhone, it briefly vibrates to signal me that I've turned it silent. Um, you know, that's an, that's an example. Or any displays that change shape, things like that. Um, force feedback with your error messages, those kinds of things. Okay, so, uh, and then finally, haptic input, that is maybe more interesting. When is the computer sensing physical, mechanical input from the world. It's actually not that rare. It's actually very common. So when you tilt the phone. Say again? You're rotating the phone to oh. change the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm wondering whether we could place it under haptics. I think it falls into the more, more general area of sort of mechanical input maybe. Um, but yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and what are you using every day on your laptop? The keyboards or touch screen? Yeah, yeah. Whenever you you know you poke on the touch screen, uh, you exert a little force or maybe more force, and some systems can detect that. Um, um, or you use the keyboard, even just you know typing a key. That is technically, if you want, the computer is detecting that physical exertion of force and turning it into information. And of course, we've got a little more advanced things where you know the the system is force sensitive, for example, and can sense the exact amount of pressure and react to that in very detailed ways. All right, um, so uh, that's the that's the design space of multimodality. Um, and in fact, since we're um, forty five minutes in, let's take a three minute break for you guys to um, recharge, and then we're going to talk about how these things turn into different interfaces. I'll see you again in three minutes. Good, so um, moving on from, from this design space, um, let's look at what technically we have uh, and how systems have been trying to address this multimodality. So on the bottom here, uh, basically we have this picture of what the human senses are, like the building blocks on the human side, um, you know, what, what we can do. 
Um, and on the other side, we've got the computer's senses. And there is a fundamental difference here. Um, we humans basically have awesome drivers built right into our brain OS, right? Uh, so when we uh, see something, our brain has all the, all the semantic processing built in on multiple levels to take a, a visual input, for example, um, from, a, uh, you know, from, from, from our eyes and interpret that at many different levels um, you know, to detect patterns, to make those patterns into shapes, to give these shapes names and meaning, uh, and to maybe recognize the situation and to derive you know, emotion in, a, in another user's face, et cetera. We can do all this, which is great, um, but we should be, you know, it should be clear that um, not, everybody, not everybody can do this. Um, and especially computers are not really good at that. So computers, on the other hand, you know, have this, um, have these built-in drivers to detect the raw data, but everything beyond that needs to be programmed, needs to be provided, right? Um, and this is sometimes easy for some input devices, uh, and for some it's really hard. For example, if you click on a button in a 2D user interface, uh, the gesture is very clear, right? It's very clear what you did and where you clicked, and the data can be provided with very high reliability. Um, no problem. That's why it's so you know ubiquitously used, but. Um, when you do this in, in midair, uh, this is a gesture that is hard to interpret. It needs to be detected by some camera. The camera needs to be seeing you and you need to be in the camera frame. Uh, it needs to be fast enough to pick up enough detail about it, enough frames per second. Then it needs to do object detection and then it needs to you know, find the patterns, foreground, background, and needs to understand what, what the heck you were trying to say with your gesture. Right? So um, what I'm just trying to say here is as soon as you move away from you know, the established, you know, mouse, maybe pen, touch, these kinds of things, you immediately enter, um, you know, keyboard, of course, you immediately enter an area of very high uncertainty and very noisy data. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't been used. Um, and some of the things that uh, we've seen are systems that try to make use of these initial, uh, additional senses that try to rebuild some of the input sensing capabilities that humans have. For example, uh, we sometimes hear about perceptual computing or perceptual interfaces. They're systems that basically just try to detect um, things beyond the standard you know, keyboard, mouse, and monitor, um, oftentimes using computer vision um, to provide interactions that you couldn't otherwise have. Um, now, um, a variant of this are attentive interfaces. Um, these are interfaces that are context aware. So they try to determine uh, what the user is currently doing and find the best time to interrupt them or to communicate in general. You know, intention, an attentive interface is basically aware of um, what you are currently up to. And this is often using eye contact and gestures, for example, um, but you can also use things like mouse movement or, or typing um, so computer vision, again, plays a major role in these things, but you know, sometimes you can also use things like keyboard in input streams and stuff like that to pay attention, to try to pay attention to what the user is currently doing and find the best moment, for example, to display um, an informational dialogue, right? If I want to tell the user that uh, their printer is out of paper, um, I can tell them when they're in the middle of some you know, high energy task, or I can tell them when they have a little bit of a lull in their interaction, and that is probably the better moment, you know, rather than interrupting a high energy, uh, I don't know, voice con video conferencing brainstorming meeting, for example. Inactive interfaces are another variant of this um, that help users to um, basically um, form, form not, it, it, they try to communicate based on the active use of hands and body. Um, this is basically things that we do and that we know how to do um, as you could call it muscle memory, um, you know, typing or driving a car, dancing, playing a musical instrument, modeling objects from clay. These are all tasks that are really hard to, you know, to, to describe or to express in a, you know, in a, in a GUI uh, with, with mouse and keyboard and, and um, you know, icons and pointers. So uh, these systems try to use multiple sensors to detect these activities and to put some meaning into them and to understand what's going on. So a system that would understand uh, the way that somebody is modeling an object from clay uh, would be an inactive interface. So 
the point of all these systems is that they are trying to be um, to make use of this multimodality and to feel more natural, uh, to feel more efficient, and also to improve um, the notion of trust between people and and the system, so that we have a chance to uh, you know build systems that we can use reliably um, to interact with. Where is this being applied? All kinds of things, right? So you can have remote collaboration software that detects when, for example, a, a user is speaking. That is very common. You know, even here, Zoom today is doing that. When I talk, my picture gets moved to the foreground. Um, and uh, but you can see these things in like driving support, for example, telling when the user is distracted um, or when the user is getting tired. You know, that's a big one right now in cars. Um, to detect that and to to then engage safety protocols, um, but you know also in the arts to detect, like I was saying, for example, the shaping of a of a clay pot, and to sort of know what the um, artisan is doing to maybe capture that exper expertise and pass it on to people who want to learn the craft. Now that's multimodal in general, and now let's take a look at the first big. Um, mode beyond vision that uh, we have to talk about, and that is audio. Um, audio is a fairly well-established communication sense, um, and we're first going to look at the output direction. So when the computer is creating audio of different kinds, uh, before we then later move to the input direction, where the computer is listening to us. So let's look at audio output first. Um, I want to briefly collect some ideas from you guys. Um, and again, you can just speak up. What are some of the advantages of having audio as an output over uh, the visual channel that the computer can display information? So what's, what's good about the computer being able to sound, create sound for information um, instead of or in addition to uh, creating it visually? You can always hear the audio, even when you're not actively looking at the computer somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a huge one, right? Uh, the fact that audio is not directed, right? The fact that you can even detect a signal when you're not actively looking at that particular screen or display. Um, so that's a huge advantage in you know um, safety critical situations. You want an audio signal. Um, when you're about to hit another car rather than, you know, a little thing blinking away on, a, on some display. <clears throat> what else? <coughs> it's related to that undirectedness, if you want. This has a couple of implications. Well, even if you are directly looking at the screen, you can only ever see a tiny bit of that screen um, consciously while if the audio comes and together with a little notification on the bottom of your screen you hear the audio but chances are you will miss that notification yeah yeah so we don't need direct visual contact and uh, like you're saying our our ability to really read something in detail is actually fairly small we need to uh, shift attention visually to another area if something is going on there um, and audio gets you even when you are distracted or looking somewhere else, uh, it will it will get you. In fact, it doesn't need any screen space at all. That's a big one too. You know, think about very small devices, um, you know, sm uh, a smart button or something that you have on your on your jacket. There's probably not enough space to make any kind of use useful display, but you could create a very complex audio interface with that. You know, think about the, um, you know, the. Um, like the dot, for example. Well, maybe that's not that's a good idea because it doesn't talk back to you. But any devices that don't have space for a display can often still use audio because audio uses needs only very little, you know, space physically to create. You put a tiny speaker in, um, and then it can provide fairly complex signals. And finally, um, audio. What about what about groups of users? What's the advantage for audio there? Well, you can reach a lot of users with one audio source, and it's a lot more difficult to have a screen that can reach that many users. 
Exactly. I mean, if you've ever, you guys have all gone to school and you all remember the bell uh, that you know announces the end of class, right? So that certainly reaches everybody, although people are not all looking at uh, one display. Okay, so those are great advantages. And um, what are the disadvantages of audio compared to visual? When it's gone, it's gone. We just get one chance to hear what the message was. And if we weren't focused or we were distracted, we have to find another way to repeat it. Exactly. So, um, I mean, when you, when you listen to a, a video recording, like a video lecture, for example, that's been recorded, um, and you have that one moment and you, and you kind of space out and you get back like, okay, what did they just say? You have to rewind and get back to it. Uh, it's much harder to do that than um, you know uh, using using a, a visual medium, and when it's you know when it's a real time uh, system, you, where you can't just roll back. You don't have a recording, but you're just listening to somebody talk. Then there's no way to go back, right? You have to ask them. Oh, sorry, could you say that again, please? Um, uh, so it's it's transient. It's it's only there while it's there. It, it doesn't have a a, perm, a, perm, a permanent visual. Uh, representation. What else? Uh, this it reaches the entire group can be a disadvantage if it's, for example, a personal message. I don't want it to be read out for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Or even just you know, every time you send an email, it goes whoosh. I think that yeah. will drive everybody in that big office crazy in like 10 minutes, right? Um, so you reach everybody that can be a blessing or an, and a curse as well. Um, anything else? Um, yeah, the amount of data is limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're clearly dealing with data that needs to be spaced out over time. You have to listen to an audio signal for a while before you can make any sense of it, uh, even if it's just you know a few fractions of a second. And um, it certainly has a a lower um, sort of information bits per second uh, uh, cap capability. We learned that in DIS one already uh, than the visual channel. Uh, so those are some of the disadvantages. Um, it's undirected. It grabs the attention, you know, even if you don't want it to, um, annoying uh, the user or maybe the people around them. It's transient, as Chris was saying. Um, it also dictates the speed, right? It means I have to listen to it at the speed that it comes. Um, when it's a recording, I can speed it up or slow it down. But when it's real time, uh, I can't do anything about that. So some of you guys might wish that I would be talking a little faster right now. Some others might wish that I talk a little more slowly right now, but eh, got to deal with it, right? It comes at the speed that it comes. And also, this is maybe a little more subtle. Um, we can put a lot of visual information in front of a user. And while you can only look at one information at a time, a lot of it can be exposed to you at the same time. But try that with audio. Try to place you know, 16 audio sources in front of a user. Um, and it gets confusing very quickly, right? We have a certain capability to zero in on one audio signal. Our ears are pretty amazing doing that, um, but it's not the same as, as the visual channel. So it's very different um, in what is going on. So um, with that in place, how can we use audio in the output direction? There's a bunch of different options that we have. Um, and these options are kind of staggered by how much uh, meaning we basically put into these things and how much we design higher abstract level uh, meaning into it. Um, and at the, uh, at the very simplest and the most natural, I, I could say, uh, you have noise, right? I can create some kind of noise with the computer um, and that noise could mean something to, to people. And there's usually not much you can, you can shape about the noise. Of course, you can pick different noises, lots of different noises. In fact, we'll see an example of that just in a second. Um, and noise is surprisingly powerful as a, as a multimodal um, input, uh, or, sorry, output technique. Um, you, you'll see that in a second. Um, but it doesn't, a single noise doesn't carry that much meaning with it. Now there is, uh, then you can, you can shape it to be a beep then you can sort of influence the pitch, you know, high, low beep. Um, you can create from then, from a single beep, you can create a melody, which would then mean that you can have a, a sequence of pitches 
play a little, you know, sort of doodle-doot, okay, sound when something has been transferred successfully, for example. Uh, you can influence how loud these are, each of these notes, you can put emphasis on certain notes, you can change the durations, you can change, change the sequence of notes, so there's more design opportunities there. Um, chords, then musically speaking, um, add another dimension to that, so then you can create um, everything that melody can, plus you can now create um, a harmonic effect so that people perceive, for example, a minor or major chord, and these are linked in our, at least in our cultural uh, circles to, um, you know, having a meaning of uh, you know, dissonance or, or natural um, harmony. Um, and finally, the, the most complex uh, output channel is probably speech, where you have um, the melody of the uh, voice, but you have also the meaning of the spoken text uh, in, in, in the contents. So a lot of emotion is being carried with that. Um, and, but that's also, of course, true with, with chords and to a certain degree, even with, with simple melodies. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, when you, if you want to see this, this at, at play, just, you know, think of the, any Star Wars movie. And when they make, you know, um, R2D2 beep in these uh, interesting ways, um, it's actually carefully designed to be sound like almost it's just a beep level uh, thing going on, but really they're creating little melodies out of it. And they put even emotional content into this, into the signals that we then interpret into that, that um, musical sequence. So let's look at um, noise. Um, noise sounds like it's, you know, like the, the, the poor kid and the block here, uh, but actually it's, it's very powerful because this is the only out audio output that will directly represent something that we would also interpret in our real life. In fact, it's the only audio, out audio output that computers or technical systems will create um, naturally without it being designed. Right, so a computer running right now, my laptop is standing next to me here and I can hear the fan spinning at a certain level because it's warm and it's doing a lot of work. Uh, and if that gets too much, then I know something is off, right? Um, so audio output has the advantage that it is something that we know from nature and we are very good at interpreting noise. Um, for example, if I take, you know, um, Right. Maybe I'll hear this. I'm going to take something and that's maybe able to hear that. Did you hear that? No. Okay. That was me scratching with a pen over paper. Okay. So those are the problems of electronic um, online teaching. <laughs> Can't get that across. But you know, the sound of a pen moving over a piece of paper is actually something that you just need to hear it and you know what's going on. You immediately see the pen and the paper in front of you, basically. Um, so we're, we're very good at this. You know, evolutionally speaking, this was always important for us to, to be good at. Um, so just a few examples of the kinds of noises that a computer makes when it's, when it's working. You know, uh, I already mentioned the fan spinning. Uh, but if you still have a CD, DVD drive, then you've got the drive, you know, like seeking or looking for stuff. If you still have a, a non-SSD hard drive, then you know that the hard drive seeking is actually an, an interesting sound that um, you know used to tell you quite a bit whether your computer was hanging in an endless loop, booting up, or whether it was actually making progress. Um, some systems have a slight hiss in the backlight that you know, especially young kids can still hear. Um, when you switch uh, your your um, you know your desktop computer on or off, you've got a hopefully satisfying click sound from the, 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 the power switch. Uh, when your printer warms up, it makes a particular noise. I have a printer next door and I know exactly uh, what it is doing when it, when it makes a certain se sequence of noises and I can almost tell whether there was a paper jam or whether everything went fine without looking at the, the messages because the sounds are so familiar to me. And none of those sounds are designed, right? I'm not talking about an error beep. I'm just talking about the natural noises that these systems make when they are operating. Um, and so this idea of uh, natural noises being something that we can interpret very easily, almost subconsciously, uh, has led to the idea of um, what's called auditory icons. Uh, what that means is that you 
add these natural sounds to uh, things that you use on your computer, which is you know a world that wouldn't naturally create these sounds. So when I throw a piece of paper into uh, the de a trash bag, into a real trash bag, it makes noise. Um, but if I throw uh, an electron document in a, into a recycle bin on my desktop, on my computer, it normally wouldn't make a noise. But if you add the noise of paper dropping into a trash can to that interaction, you can actually um, help people feel uh, that these interactions are more realistic. Now, not everything maps to a sound. For example, write formatting a piece of text, eh, it gets hard to associate a good sound with that. But you know there are a lot of direct manipulation interactions that that have physical analogies that we can um, put sound underneath, um, and so that's the idea of of audio you know audioization of of computer everyday tasks. So let's do another quick um, uh, in class exercise here to to exercise your brains a bit. Um, let's say you uh, you are hired by Adobe right after you finish your studies here, and they say oh. We want the next version of Photoshop to have, be called Sonic Photoshop, not because we put a hedgehog in there, but, but because we want to basically add sound effects to everyday actions that people do in Photoshop. And you know, here's a couple of examples. So they say, okay, so come up with some ideas for what could be the sounds for, for the following operations. You know, drawing, moving an object, copying it, deleting it, rotating it. Um, so again, I'll, I'll take some uh, oh, that's funny. Nick saying like my fan was too loud. I couldn't hear the noise. Uh, thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, what kind of sounds would you uh, uh, create, so artificially create to make people, uh, you know, to give people sort of sound support um, in these operations? You can just shout it in or raise your hand, whatever you prefer. Yeah, we got Kai. Go ahead, Kai. Uh, drawing is easy. Just scraping over um, pen, scraping over paper. Maybe depending on um, which drawing tool, we use a different pen type. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, copy, maybe the sound a copier makes. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Yep. Um, is a bit, uh, yeah. <laughs> Delete, maybe something throw something in a trash and uh, use that sound. Uh, move and, and rotate. Actually, that uh, that's more or less the same sound, just something scraping over a surface, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's it already. OK, yeah, the good, good example. So I like the idea of, of drawing not just being you know, the, the, the standard pencil drawing, but depending on which tool you pick, the sound changes. So that could actually alert people to that the fact that they're using the wrong tool when they're not looking closely um, and be sort of an interesting additional uh, thing to add uh, to, to basically create this more robust interaction by using multiple modalities. Um, copying the example of a photocopier, I like that too, because what it shows is that um, we may not always pick noises from the sort of natural, you know, trees and, and forests and birds and bees kind of world. Uh, we may pick things that are already culturally established, technologically established sounds that we know, and just carry those over to the computer. Right? That's what we uh, what we do here. And if we, for example, pick the photocopier, um, and um, for deletion, um, just to give you an example, um, there was a, a program called KidPix years ago, um, and it was a programming, it was a drawing uh, application for kids. Now, yeah, it had sort of a childlike interface and, and big, you know, colorful buttons. But why everybody loved KidPix was because uh, it had a function like every application to erase the current picture. But when you were erasing your picture, you could pick from like, I don't know, a dozen different effects to do that. So you could like wash it out with some water and you would hear the sound of water washing out your picture or you could blow it up and have a giant explosion, both sounds and visuals on your screen. Um, and I don't know how many more there were, snipping it up with the scissors or something. So, and kids loved that, right? All the ways to destroy your picture. That was very, uh, uh, very much enjoyed. Um, and all of these being, you know, sort of backed up by sounds. Um, 
undo is often an interesting challenge, um, how to do that. Um, somebody once suggested the rewind sound of a cassette player. Now that means that you need to find a user who still knows what a cassette player is, which might be a challenge these days. Um, but rotation, for example, I've seen interfaces that when you rotate something actually create these tiny little clicks on every degree, you know, go like tick, 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 and maybe like a slightly louder tick when you get to like a 90 or 45 degree angle. Uh, and that can be quite effective to help you understand that you're turning uh, or not turning, especially if there's some snapping in the tool uh, to those degrees. Uh, and each click literally means that you've now turned it one uh, step further. <coughs> so this idea isn't new. Um, we've had this for a long time. In fact, uh, the first person who came up with this was Bill Gaber, um, an HCI researcher uh, at the uh, Royal College of Arts in, in London. Um, who in 1989 proposed the so-called Sonic Finder. So the Mac had been out for a couple of years back then, and people had gotten used to sort of, you know, the desktop and the trash can and so on. And he said, let's enhance the Apple Mac Finder uh, by adding auditory icons using noises for, for everyday desktop operations and objects. Um, so he did something that was a little cleverer than, than what we just did sort of ad, ad hoc here. Because uh, he said, I'm going to associate materials to the different things in the Finder interface. Uh, and these materials can be um, wood, for example, and he used wood for individual files. So a file would always, when you moved it across the desktop, for example, make a sound like a piece of wood being moved across um, a, a table. Whereas folders had a papery sound. So when you opened or closed a folder, uh, it would make a, a papery sound. Uh, when you moved it across the desk, it would sound more like a piece of paper being shoved across the desk. Um, applications, on the other hand, had a metallic sound. So when you, uh, you know, drop them on the desktop, for example, they would make the sound of some kind of metal dropping on the tabletop. Um, and he, he went one step further. He said, let's um, basically make some physical assumptions on these virtual objects. So not just things are made out of different materials based on their kind, you know, folders versus files, but also the bigger something is, the heavier it is. Um, so the bigger files or, you know, larger or more uh, folders with more items in them would start to become heavier. And he would simulate that in the sound feedback, um, you know, of a heavier item. Um, and he used, you know, the, sm the smashing sound of throwing something into a wastebasket. And of course, it would sound different when you threw an application into the wastebasket. It would be like this metallic clang, which would alert you to, oh, you are deleting an app, which maybe you don't want to do. Um, uh, and um, copying was a, a particular challenge because unlike these immediate actions of moving something from, from A to B or something, Copying is basically something that for large files would require some progress feedback. Um, and uh, what he basically created was a sort of um, uh, a sequence like filling the jug with water where the rising pitch of the, uh, of the sound as the water glass fills up would be suggesting uh, the progress you were making. Um, so this was one way to, um, that, that they addressed the, the copying issue. This was tested in users, um, and, and the feedback was really interesting. When people first saw this, they thought, yeah, this is nice, but, you know, I don't really need this. Um, it's, it's a, it feels a little playful and unnecessary. But then they left them with it for a while, and then they turned it off again. And at that moment, people were very confused. A lot of people, uh, felt uncomfortable because all of a sudden their objects weren't making those noises anymore that they had gotten used to. So you can see how quickly our brain is willing to, ex to extend the simulation of a virtual desktop to associate these, these virtual items with actual um, physical objects. Uh, and when you take away this, this link, then again, people feel a bit uncomfortable. Now, uh, of course, um, We've seen um, uh, the, uh, the the audioization of, of everyday actions uh, become an everyday feature in commercial applications. Uh, it made it into an early uh, one of the earliest web browsers that you know Tim Berners-Lee, the Mosaic web browser, um, had an experimental version that contained that feature. 
uh, and it's been since then it's been making it into you know everyday desktops right you you know this from windows you know this from the mac um you know this from the office applications that there are certain sounds that are backed up by this i'm going to very quickly show you maybe a, an example of a of another application called comic life here um let me just move that over um so i need to share that screen hold on share comic life there we go oh and now i need to of course i need to share my audio otherwise you're not going to hear this there we go so this is a this is a simple application that's been out for many years um, that lets you create sort of little comics and um, the only thing that's interesting here is that uh, for us is that when you drag something in it always makes a noise right so I'm dropping a speech bubble did you guys hear that yes okay fantastic right. so uh, speech bubbles make this one kind of noise you know to play something. Uh, if you, on the other hand, place for, you know, if you go over these, you get this little, like, uh, almost like a, a noise of, of a flipping through options here. Um, and if I drop something else, like this lettering, uh, this big thing, I get a sound. I don't know exactly what it is. It's either a crowd going, ah, or something else. I don't know, but you're going to hear it yourself. Ooh. Yeah, so you get, like, tinkle, tinkle, and people, like, ooh, very, being very amazed. Um, if on, on the other hand, you drop in um, a background, for example, you get this very simple like plunk sound because it's kind of like the foundation of your comic. It gets dropped into your uh, canvas at the background. So it's a very simple and sort of plunky sound like that. All right, enough of that. Uh, there's more in this, in this application, but I just wanted to show you an example of um, how these apps today uh, use this effect. Okay, so back to the slides. Here we go. Um, Bill Gaver uh, shortly afterwards uh, discovered something else uh, a strength of auditory icons uh, you know this this like audialization of processes also helped people collaborate when they had no full understanding of the entire process so the idea here was um, this was a simulation of a coke bottling plant and in the user experiment they they created two views which you can see with these slightly dotted lines here these two squares so one user was only seeing the first half of the plant the other user was only seeing the second half of the plan. <coughs> and um, the two users were not in the same room, like they were separated from each other. Um, and they had together, they had to make sure that these, the Coke bottling plant was, was running smoothly. So, you know, no bottles were falling off the, um, you know, off the conveyor belt and there was enough Coke liquid. And, but if you didn't have, for example, if you had, still a lot of coke liquid but your bottles were out you hadn't uh, provided more bottles then the water would you know, the, the liquid would basically splash and you would hear a splashing sound or if your uh, if your bottles uh, if your if your final stack was full uh, and you weren't taking care of you shipping your your coke bottles off then the, you would start hearing you know uh, glass breaking noises as bottles fell off the end of your conveyor belt because they weren't being packaged up anymore and um the idea was, you know, they had to basically keep this thing running smoothly, buy more ingredients, buy more bottles when needed. It's a bit like SimCity, if you want. And they had an audio chat between the two users, and they had this audit auditory feedback added in. Um, uh, and the effect was really uh, was really uh, interesting because collaboration was clearly improved when people had this auditory feedback, and it showed that. Um, the visual interface was super important for having an overview and a view of the task, but uh, the auditory icons were able to grab attention, um, not just when things were off screen, but also, and, and happening, for example, in, uh, with the other users part of the plant, but also uh, when they were on screen, in fact, but because you were so busy and you know trying to juggle so many things at the same time, 
that the auditory icons help you start paying attention to a particular part of your process. All right, so that's enough about um, auditory icons um, that use noise. Um, let's take the next look at um, melodies. So the next thing you can do with audio is to use melodic output, which means um, you don't create you know, noises like uh, swooshing on paper, but you actually start creating synthetic abstract tones, music, melodies, uh, that are nonverbal, not not you know, with any uh, you know uh, lyrics or anything, but just uh, basically um, computer sounds at different pitches. Um, this was first proposed by Blattner in 1989, so same year as the auditory uh, icons from from Bill Gaver, and we'll see a little bit of a uh, you know competition between these two ideas, and we'll we'll evaluate them against each other. Um, and um, earcons, she called her systems. Um, were basically built from some basic motifs, if you like, like tiny little melodies, you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, something like this, that would be used to represent certain things. Now, there is a, so such a motif, if you have a short pitch sequence that is very rhythmically uh, recognizable, <coughs> uh, you can change a couple things about it. You can change the timbre, which means basically it's a fancy way of saying the instrument that you're using. Um, you can change the intensity, the volume of it. Uh, you can also change the speed of it, and you can change the register. Do I play it at a high, medium, or low pitch? Um, so there are lots of ways that you can manipulate these ear cons, these little melodies, uh, in order to describe things and to express meaning. Um, so as you can probably imagine, you can combine these into pretty complex messages. Now, if you are thinking that this could be annoying, you are not entirely mistaken. Um, we have a demo of earcons uh, that I think we want to we want to show you now. Um, are you uh, ready to to give us a demo, uh, Sebastian? Of course. So All right. So can you see that? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, this is um, the uh, window that contains different icons. And by clicking on these icons, we will hear the sounds that are associated with these different icons. So you see actually that the icons are already sort of clustered. So we have um, columns for folders, programs, and files. And in the lines, we see different families like paint, write, draw, so the type of application that they are associated with. Or if we, for instance, have a look at how the paint program would sound like. Can you hear that? Yes. That's great. Um, this sounds like that. On the other hand, the file for the paint program would sound like this. And another file like that. So this is probably a more or a larger file. If we click, uh, but if we compare different types of programs, so this was paint, and the draw program sounds like that. The hypercar program sounds like that. So you actually see that this pattern or the melody is the same across all programs. Um, and this sort of chime that, or the, the effect, the timbre that we hear there has an effect on also on the files. So while the paint picks up this, this sound, the draw file really belongs to the uh, draw application. But of course, this not only works for apps and documents, this also works for menu items. So in this menu, we see, if you have a look at menu one, we see there's an open, a close, and an edit button, or in the menu two, delete and create. So you already see that open and close are actually actions that are sort of inverted to each other. And this is exactly what we hear. 
So if we have a look at or have a listen to the open button and the close button, you hear that they are sort of played back in reverse. Same with the Lee and Create. Um, now, of course, edit and print sort of have a different action. And we will see how they fit into that. So remember, open was that, close was that, and edit sounds like this. So we see that there is this pattern that we already know from open and close, which also belongs into this menu category. And they now sort of take a specific part of that and repeat it twice if I listen to that correctly. Copy is that and undo is sort of makes sense. Now where Econs really shine is that you can combine what you've seen from the menu entries or the actions and the objects that we work with. So um, if you remember, this was our open sound and the hypercard sound for the um, app was like that. And we could now synthetically put them together into a single basically sound clip that represents open hypercard. And of course, this also works for printing out a document. <laughs> so as you already hear, this can be sort of annoying, I guess. Um, if there's nothing to add, we can <laughs> already stop here. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. I'm going to uh, take over again. All right, so uh, at this point, I first of all, I have to say extra kudos to Sebastian because you wouldn't believe how much effort it is to uh, to get this <laughs> this demo running from 1989. Uh, he's running a, a, a virtual Mac emulator on his current uh, era Mac uh, and then running this thing inside that. So that's always a, a little bit of a computer archeology span to get these things to actually work in, in practice. Um, so thanks Sebastian and uh, You've already seen this is this may not be sort of the most enjoyable thing if your computer keeps playing these weird little music pieces to you. Um, but there are some guidelines that uh, Blattner uh, wrote up and I just wanted to share them with you. Uh, not that you need to learn all of these by heart, but the point is um, uh, to see what kind of you know detailed design guidelines you can then derive from from user studies with this. So they found, for example, that if you do want to use ear cons, uh, these music things, then using different instruments for distinction is a good choice. Um, whereas, for example, pitch uh, and register, which is just basically large pitch differences, register basically jumping by whole octaves, um, don't really work that well on their own because uh, small differences, a lot of people cannot tell reliably, especially once you, if you don't hear them right next to each other. So uh, people won't be able to remember whether something was a th you know, three and a half notes higher than the other thing. They just don't, very few people have absolute pitch and can do that. Um, they also limited their pitches to a, a reasonable uh, frequency range so that you can, you know, wouldn't find them too, um, too annoying. Um, also found that varying rhythm is a good thing, but you need to, again, you need to do it very clearly. You need to vary them greatly so that people who don't have a musical um, uh, education uh, can still reliably recognize the differences and not use too fast notes, you know, so eighths in a typical tempo was sort of their recommendation. Um, and you can vary the number of notes. That is, that is all, also a good um, design sort of um, material to work with. Um, you can even parallelize uh, rhythms. So basically play two things next to each other uh, together um, and people can still tell the two apart. We're good at this. I mean, uh, intensity or volume is notoriously bad for distinction because you might have turned or down your volume at your computer up or down, so you're thrown off. Um, and, and also, um, you can't put this in too high of a, of a dynamic range with like really now loud or really soft uh, noises will not be a good idea for the computer from a usability point of view. 
Um, so the recommendation is here to just stay 10 to 20 uh, decibels over the background noise. But what works well is localization. So putting things, if people have a stereo headset that they're wearing, then putting it at different positions in the stereo spectrum is actually something people are fairly good at. Again, our ears are really good at localizing where a noise is coming from. It's uh, quite amazing, actually. And then they joined the different motifs with a short gap um, to create these longer, longer sequences. All right, so this was an example of using music uh, as the audio output, uh, melodies, if you like. Um, and uh, these ear cons, nah, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not something you want to enable on your desktop for every day. But I wanted to show you another example um, that actually gives you a surprising use of uh, melodic output. And the system is called Gate Shoe. Um, the Gate Shoe was designed by Joe Paradiso at the MIT Media Lab in 2004. Uh, and in this research project, he was trying to help people who have um, problems with their walking patterns. This sometimes happens after a stroke or based on certain, uh, certain diseases, neurological or muscle diseases, you may have trouble walking um, in, a straight, uh, in a straight way. Um, and so uh, this project gave people shoes to wear uh, that would remind them whether their walking pattern was right or whether it was off, whether they were falling back into a pattern that wasn't healthy for them or unsafe because they might fall over or something like that. Uh, and the way that he did this is very interesting because he basically created, first of all, he created this shoe that is shock full with sensors like crazy. Um, so uh, don't worry if you don't, can't read everything here, basically just take away from it that it was a lot of sensors. Um, and uh, the feedback then was a constant stream of basically piano music. Um, and that piano music was harmonious and, and you know, sounding positive and, and very much in tune when you were work, walking straight and you, your feet were aligned correctly. But as your feet sort of left that arrangement, uh, it was actually changing in tune. Uh, so let's listen to that. Um, real quick here in this short video clip. Um, I'm not sure, actually, I may have to uh, change my uh, sharing so that you guys can hear that just a sec. Um, yes, like that. So you get the idea. Um, again, you probably don't want to do this for uh, every day because then it's going to drive you drive you nuts. Um, but it might be a good it might be a good approach for um, you know a, a therapy session, for example. Okay, so um, from that on to um, I think we're actually, let's take a, a three minute break maybe before we move up. Yeah, okay, we're gonna finish that topic and then take our break. Um, so I just wanna complete this um, because if you, in, in 93, Bill Gaber looked at these, uh, uh, you know, the, the two ways that, that audio had been introduced into the user interface using his own auditory icons, the noise approach basically, and the ear cons, the musical approach. Um, and he realized something interesting um, when you, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Siri is talking back to me today. Um, so when you listen to music, uh, this is about perceiving the notes. Um, you are interested in the pitch, the loudness, the timbre, the music, the, the emotion behind it. Um, and, and this actually music listening is actually a fairly well studied area from a psychoacoustical view. Um, we know quite a lot about how people do this. Um, and that is the area that um, earcons are exploring the, the, the system by Blattner or by, by the gate shoe. Um, the auditory icons, on the other hand, are doing something else. They are uh, not using the 
users' musical listening abilities, but their everyday listening abilities. So it's much more about perceiving events. Um, the listener is, is more interested in where is it coming from, you know, left, right, behind me, in front of me. Imagine yourself in the Stone Age, you know, running through the jungle and you hear a rustling noise. You want to know where that's coming from, right? So we're really good at that. Uh, in everyday listening, we are interested in the size of the object that makes the sound. We derive that using our, our uh, existing knowledge. We, we try to understand what material is making the noise. Um, we try to understand the uh, interactions that are happening. Um, so when I scratched the pen on paper earlier, uh, all these things you are immediately modeling in your head. Uh, and we try to understand with how much force something is happening. For example, you might be, you know, uh, running through nature and you might hear some, uh, you know, tree gently swaying and creaking a bit, or you might hear it, you know, almost breaking uh, and you will immediately understand that there's a lot of force involved in the noise and big objects. So you'll look out to not, you know, get that tree on your head. Interestingly, the, um, this everyday listening is much less well explored from a psychoacoustics point of view. Um, so Gaver looked into this a little more and, and found that there are basically three um, different general categories of everyday sound producing events. One is things that vibrate, for example, through impact. Uh, uh, when, I, when I do this, for example, you know, on the glass here, that's a, that's a vibration. Or when I, when I scrape over the paper, the thing that you didn't hear earlier on, um, you know, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's a vibration noise. Uh, then we have aerodynamic sounds like explosions or continuous noises of wind, for example. And we have, uh, if you want, uh, liquid sounds like water dripping, for example. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that he found that while people often have, have trouble identifying exactly what object created a sound, these three categories, vibration, aerodynamics, and liquids, are always identified correctly. Um, so, <clears throat> as you can probably imagine, if you think about these two uh, abilities, uh, evolutionary speaking, from our, you know, hundreds of thousands of years that we've been running through the woods and, and, and running away from tigers and such, uh, we are very good at everyday listening. Uh, whereas our musical listening abilities have been created more in a cultural setting, uh, they are younger, you know, evolutionary speaking, and also usually not as survival critical. So not in you know, the brain hasn't, um, you know, basically uh, signed as much space to uh, to that area. So and that's why I think the um, uh, the auditory icons are the thing. Uh, it's not surprising that they survive to this day in everyday user interface in the computer, whereas we're not seeing a lot of the use of these musical listening earphones. Uh, and the last point I want to make before we take a break uh, is um, there's another way to use audio uh, of the noise or melody kind to uh, create output by the computer. And this area is called audialization. In fact, you could, you could consider um, the auditory icons and earphones also an example of audialization. It's basically just like visualization, but for audio. Um, this was um, used um, by researchers, for example, to visualize um, things like algorithms. So there is an, an interesting work from, uh, from James Alty, uh, who uh, wrote a paper on how you can audialize the sound of quicksort at work. And you guys all know quicksort, right? You know how it works. Um, and so the, this, this way in which things sort of get mixed and bubble to the top and, and exchange and stuff, imagine listening to a, a sequence of sounds um, that changes over time as you hear the elements being sorted. It's a very interesting approach. It's not easy to find a good audialization for these processes, but it seems to be uh, something that can help you with debugging, for example. If you hear that your, audio, that your algorithm isn't working right, then that's an interesting approach, isn't it? Um, another example that's uh, actually quite well established, um, uh, also done by Maura Blattner, um, uh, was scientific audialization. So I used uh, a, um, a simulation of a turbine in a, you know, in a 3D modeling program. I'm simulating a turbine. 
uh, that I'm designing. And uh, I let, you know, virtually I let wind run over the turbine and I find the areas of turbulence and I can listen to these turbulences um, instead of just seeing them. So again, gives you an interesting additional channel of exploring your data. Um, and in, so visually uh, showing data, visualization, data visualization has been around ever since computers have been able to do graphics, basically. Um, Audialization we've seen now, and in fact, there is a, a fairly new research field that's only a couple of years old, and one of our own students has, I would almost say, started it, uh, and that is physical, um, you could almost call it hapticalization of, of data, um, to uh, create data visualizations using 3D objects, often 3D printed. That's why it's you know related to our work in the Fab Lab and stuff like this. Um, so this is an area where you can see audio in, in use in uh, providing insight into data or, or algorithms. All right, let's take another uh, short break here, stretch your legs a little, and then we will jump into the big topic of speech. Okay, so um, now let's talk about audio output at the sort of highest level of um, underlying semantics. Not I'm, that I'm saying that noises aren't, aren't rich in meaning. They certainly are. We, they're very evocative. But the, the artificial structure, so to say, that's being imposed on the audio stream um, and, and the meanings that are being designed into it are, of course, extremely high when we move to, to speech. Um, speech, uh, known also as um, you know, text-to-speech to systems, TTS, um, generally uh, just use recorded chunks of different sizes, right? We used to have speech systems that would record whole sentences and then basically just use a simple algorithm to pick the right sentence to say to the user, but of course that's very inflexible. Um, but the sentences are brained, right? They sound just like a natural person speaking because guess what? It's a natural person speaking and being recorded. So this was the level of uh, speech synthesis when you are you know, in the area of, of tape recording or a very, very simple menu-based systems that would know exactly that they only would have to use a limited number of sentences. Now, to get more flexible, of course, you need to cut up your speech into smaller chunks. And the first step would be to use words. And uh, we've also seen um, a, you know, a couple decades of that kind of work because you know the systems that sound weird because they are putting the words together from a, a collected database, but somehow the speech melody is now off, right? Because the word gets recorded um, and you get these results like, uh, next stop, New York, calling at Atlanta and so on, right? So uh, we've got these weird, slightly disconnected uh, sentences. They are understandable, no question, but they don't sound like a real person speaking anymore but it gives you more flexibility. And more recently, we've seen speech being dis, sort of disassembled into even smaller parts um, called phonemes. Phonemes are basically the smallest building blocks of speech. Um, and there they can make a very flexible uh, and small database. Um, and then you can put together basically all spoken words from that um, in fact, reach a sometimes better simulation of realistic sound than you get with the recorded words. Um, but only recently with, you know, artificial intelligence um, advances, we've been able to actually synthesize speech um, in a way that it sounds sort of natural. So today when, when your voice assistants are talking to you, whether it's Google or Siri or, or whoever, um, this is basically looking back at 40 dec you know, four decades of speech um, synthesis research, and we're finally getting to an area where it's, it begins to sound somewhat natural. Um, <coughs> now, um, just like with, um, with audio in general as an output, speech, of course, has a couple advantages and it has a couple disadvantages in, uh, when, you, when you use it. Um, uh, yourself in a uh, in a system. Um, providing a, a speech interface is, of course, a very natural way for us because we're very used to in you know interacting with others via speech. Uh, so it's familiar. It can also carry an emotional um, 
sort of level that uh, a purely text, uh, like a visual text uh, chat uh, communication, for example, won't be able to carry. Uh, it's great for the visually impaired, of course, if you can enable that. Um, and it allows eyes-free use. So it's, it's sometimes the only choice, for example, in the car. But uh, some of the disadvantages of audio as a channel, of course, carry over to speech as well. It's slower than uh, visual because of the bandwidth of the channel. It's transient or ephemeral. It goes away again and you have to go back uh, if you want to re-listen to it. It's pretty hard to browse or search. Um, if you've ever tried to find something in a collection of, of YouTube videos, um, you know that it's much harder than, you know, searching through a bunch of PDFs by, by keyword. Um, and um, synthetic speech is, is having a hard time, even today, uh, to put the prosody of a, of a spoken, uh, um, of spoken language into it correctly. That's why when you listen to, you know, speech assistants today, they sometimes sound like they're just a little bit off, right? They, they have this wrong inflection on there. They go up with their voice or down at a point where it doesn't make sense in our language, in, our, in, in the way that we would say it. Um, so, and while that is not perfect, then we can always tell that it's a machine talking to us, which um, of course is, is not great, right? Um, and unlike noise, um, the uh, uh, speech, of course, cannot fade into the background. So when a system is talking to us, it's hard to ignore. Uh, the best example for that, again, um, you know, in-car navigation systems, when you are having a discussion with your friend uh, who's sitting on the passenger seat, and all of a sudden, the system tells you, keep driving straight on this Autobahn for another 83 miles. You're like, that's great, thank you, but why are you interrupting us, right? So, um, if that had just been displayed on the on the dashboard, it would not have interrupted your conversation. But audio and speech in particular has that ability to interrupt you. So let's look at speech in, in humans. Um, speaking is actually one of the most amazing capabilities that we have as humans. And I want to um, create a bit of appreciation in you guys to understand what what we are actually capable of. Um, speech is the primary way we communicate as humans. Um, you know, this is how it has evolved. Um, and um, that also means that speech actually uh, activates or implicates more parts of the brain than many other functions of it. Um, in particular, we have, you know, the left brain hemisphere specialized to, to process speech. Um, left brain hemisphere, by the way, it corresponds to the right right ear, um, and it doesn't matter uh, whether it hears native language or nonsense syllables or speech in foreign languages or speech be being played backwards, it will always activate. So I need to point to this, this left, left hemisphere here. Um, and the, the task of your left ear and your right brain is usually left to pay attention to, to everything else, all the other sounds, like the non-speech sounds that we talked about earlier on. Um, um, a researcher at Stanford that uh, I had the pleasure of working with for a short time in, in while I was there um, actually uh, looked a lot at speech in humans and in and how humans perceive computers, in particular when computers start speaking. Uh, his name is uh, Clifford Nass. Um, he's unfortunately passed away recently, uh, but he uh, had some wonderful research around speaking. So I want to use some of his um, his information here on the topic. Um, speaking is a very fundamental thing that we can do. It starts extremely early in human development. In fact, as soon as you have an IQ above 50, and that is not a lot, right? 50 is really, really low. Uh, you start being capable of speech. So speech is obviously developing very early in human development. As soon as the brain weighs just a um, you know, meager 400 grams in, in, in a child's development, in a baby's development, then you can start processing speech. Um, at 18 months, basically, uh, of, of age, through the adolescence, so when you are you know, in, your, in your teenage years, you are learning an average of one new word every two hours. Uh, and that is over you know, many, many years. And that is pretty amazing. Um, 
a one day old, one day old, so just newborn, can already differentiate speech from other sounds. So just, you know, uh, just appeared on the stage of the, uh, of, um, of life and can already do this. And um, a four day old can already differentiate their native language from a foreign language. Just imagine that, you know, four day old. You wouldn't expect a lot from a four day old baby, right, a newborn. But it can already tell whether it's its own native language or something else. Um, and adults are good at differentiating something like 40 to 50 phonemes uh, per second. That is a lot. Like remember, phoneme basic building block of speech, you know, very roughly kind of like relates to syllables, maybe shorter than syllables. But if you play back anything else to people, any other sounds, uh, we can you know, process and differentiate less than 20 per second. Um, and we can cope with, the, you know, with cocktail parties through this well-known cocktail party effect where your brain is actually able to focus in on one particular speaker across the room and listen to their voice, tune into their voice, use your localized hearing to focus in on them almost like with a search beam and you can understand, maybe watch their lips and you can understand what they're saying, although a computer would be really, really, really hard pressed to understand that discussion across the room amidst all the other noise going on. But we humans can somehow do this. So we're really good at speaking. Um, that's the, the point I want to make here. And <clears throat> since speech is one of the fundamental things that we use to communicate ever since, you now every time I mention this, I see Nick's sort of virtual background there with the woods. It's a perfect background for this. Um, you know, every, every time we've been running through the woods for the last you know, couple of millennia, um, speech has been used, right? It's important. Uh, for example, uh, evolutionally, believe it or not, it's important to recognize gender because you want to procreate, right? And so you need to find members of the opposite gender to do that. Um, and so um, we still rapidly categorize voices as male or female based on the pitch, the cadence, and some other factors. Um, and, and that is just something that has been sort of hardwired into our brain because it's necessary for survival, but it has also an influence on interpreting everything that is being said. Um, so voices and the spoken words are not independent, right? Uh, the way something is being spoken will influence the meaning that we associate with it. Um, for example, a higher pitched voice will generally uh, suggest uh, a more polite person that we're listening to. Not that that's always true, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying, um, but it's just something that we've evolutionally been trained to think, so it's something that needs conscious overcoming, um, you know, conscious thinking to overcome that, uh, that, that bias, and uh, in everyday uh, life, people just don't do that. So we're really good at extracting the sort of the social aspects of, of speech. You know, every society will give you rules um, on and guiding you in attitudes, thoughts, behaviors, what you do, how you uh, interpret speech. And some of these are evolved, some of these are culturally uh, created, but they will always provide systematic guidance to people who are listening to speech uh, to determine uh, gender, uh, personality, even emotion specific aspects. Um, and uh, I mentioned Cliff Nast earlier, um, and he wrote a book uh, together with Byron Reeves at Stanford called The Media Equation. Um, and this book created uh, quite a stir in the community because it proved something that a lot of people didn't want to believe, uh, but their experiments showed it again and again and again. Um, and the key point that the two made in their, in their book, The Media Equation, is that uh, users will treat computers and other sort of interactive technologies, media, essentially like real people. Um, so what that means is that computers are social actors, or you could almost say that human-computer interaction in many cases will have many of the characteristics of a human-to-human -human interaction. Um, we've, all, we've all noticed this. I mean, you've probably... Uh, been swearing to your computer at some point as if it was a real person. Um, and, and that's a very obvious case, right? And you know that it's not a person. But there are much more subtle cases uh, because when you think about speech output, for example, 
Um, we know, and this is not something uh, that we want to discuss at length here because it's, it's, it's established psychology that people, as we just said, will associate certain things with certain ways that something is being said. They will associate something uh, with male versus female voices, uh, with um, uh, accents versus, uh, you know, one accent versus the other accent uh, of a voice, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all well documented in psychology. Uh, the point that Cliff Nass was proving with Byron Reeves was this also applies when computers create these voices or other outputs. So we basically hear somebody, hear a system say something, and we start you know, applying all our learned uh, filtering and biasing and, and, and uh, categorizing algorithms in our brain to that voice. Um, so what that means is that you can get misguided, right? You can have, you, we're having discussions with people, but we're also having discussions with technology, uh, if you want. And this discussion with technology will actually feel like a discussion with a person, uh, which can really throw you off, right? Um, so when your brain doesn't actually make a difference between, am I talking to a machine or a human? Um, you know, we can see in, in studies that the same brain areas get activated when you do one or the other. So the brain is obviously not distinguishing this very much, even if the text to each system is pretty crappy. Um, and so you cannot suppress the natural response to, to speech, regardless whether it comes from a person or from a system. Uh, and that will actually have implications for you as an HCI designer, because you need to be aware of these effects. Uh, it's, it's a danger, but it's also an opportunity, right? You can also use this in a good way to create interfaces that will evoke certain um, responses in people that are beneficial to the interaction. <clears throat> this may all sound very confusing, so I'll give you some concrete examples. Um, for example, it is a well-known fact in psychology, and this has been proven with, with experiments over and over, that if I, um, if I have one person tell you about um, a book, for example, uh, and I say, I like it very much, and I then give you four other people who tell you I like it very much, you will find that statement more, like, more likely, right? You will trust that judgment more if several people tell you about it. That's perfectly normal. Now, if I, tell you about the book and I keep telling you and I give you five different reasons why I like the book, you might still be persuaded more, but it's not as effective as if when multiple people tell you about it. Multiple sources, you know, makes perfect sense. Uh, we, are, we are wired to trust a statement more, to find it more persuasive if it is being uh, given to us by several independent speakers. This is well known and this is, you can prove it in studies. Uh, but here comes the cool thing. You now play back um, computer synthesized voices to users. And this, were exper this was experiments in the 90s. So we're not talking about, you know, 2020 Siri quality, right? Um, um, this is actually voice synthesis that is still clearly distinguishable as artificial. You do the same experiment and you play back basically five um, uh, you know, uh, five Amazon reviews of a book and you read them all with the same voice. It's like one person keeps telling you about that book, right? Um, and then you play it back with five different computer voices. So you just set it to different computer voices, five reviews, five different voices. And even with computer uh, synthesized speech, um, people will still be more persuaded. They will trust the uh, you know, the quality of the product more if five different voices read out these five different positive reviews rather than if one voice reads out these five different reviews. That is already a bit strange because remember, these are text-to-speech systems, right? So you might think somebody immediately show, sees through the rules and sees that, oh, you're just making a computer read that out. No, people still do this. And now comes the scary part. Now you take a bunch of users and you tell them up front, we are going to read five, you know, we're going to re read reviews to you uh, with 
a variety of different synthesized voices. So they know what's going on. And still, they will trust the book that gets the reviews read by five different voices more than the book that gets similarly positive reviews or even the same reviews read by um, the same voice. So people cannot turn off this built-in response. If I hear something and it sounds like it's coming from different people, I will believe, find it more believable. And this is done just by you know, tweaking the parameters of the text-to-speech system, right? You know, raising the voice of the speaker or changing the prosody or changing some, some aspects of, of their speaking. And this does not work with multiple fonts. I mean, you often see on, on like you know, um, advertising sites, five different claims from five different people and they're set in five different fonts, but people see through that. They, they don't actually believe it more just because you use different fonts, but with, um, you know, with five different voices, it works. Even if people know about it. So that should be uh, a surprise. Um, here's another one also from, from that same research that Cliff Nast did. Um, again, on credibility, this gets a little more complicated. So please stick with me. Um, this, is, this shows examples from, a, from an auction site. And uh, let's first look at the left graph here. Um, we have a female voice uh, reading um, a, um, a product description, a product review, and a male voice reading the product review. The review is always the same, right? The product is always the same. <coughs> Sorry, the product is not always the same. Um, we are having the female voice and the male voice read out descriptions of two different products. One is a, a, a female product and the other one is a, a typical male product, you know, like whatever, I don't know, um, uh, shaving cream or something like this. Um, and the credibility is shown on the y-axis here. How credible do people find these reviews? Um, so let's look at the right-hand side here. We've got the male voice reading out two reviews. One review is about a clearly female product. One is about a clearly male product. Um, and the credibility across all reviewers, reviewers are mixed here, male and female, right? Um, the credibility of the male voice for the male product um, is definitely considered much higher than the same voice, uh, sorry, the same product being described by the female voice, right? So the male voice describing a male product um, gets more trust than the female product describing the same, uh, the female voice describing the same product. Okay. Uh, and again, this is not a surprise for psychologists when you have actual people talking because this has been studied for years, but it also works with text-to-speech systems. And that is the surprise here. Um, similarly, now if you have the male voice describe a female product, um, they don't trust it. If the female uh, voice uh, describes a female product, it gets a little bit higher trust. Um, so that is an interesting effect. Uh, and it's also interesting to see that it's not the same uh, for the female voice between the different products as for the male voice for different products. It seems that, you know, um, male voices, uh, male products, if you have them described by female, the trust is extremely low here across all users. Uh, whereas with female products, the effect wasn't so strong, right? Uh, males did a little worse as speakers uh, describing female products, but not as much as um, with the male product. Now, uh, the next one is a little more revealing because now we are looking at who is listening. So on the left, we have the results from all the females listening. And we're not distinguishing products anymore here, okay? We're going across all the products. Um, so on the left, we have females listening to uh, female and male voices. And on the right, we have the males listening to female and male voices. And the interesting thing that we see here is that... Um, the female voice as a speaker across all the products, right? We're, we're leveraging, we're averaging across products here. The female voice is actually trusted by the males a little higher. So in, in first, the first thing we see here is males are generally more, more gullible, right? They just trust everything more that they're hearing apparently than females are. Um, the second thing is that the female voice is trusted a little more by the males than the, the, the females, okay? Um, but the male voice is really destroying it, right? So basically, 
the females listening to the male voice on average across all the products were trusting it way less than the males were trusting it. And they were, they're trusting it way less than the female voice. So this is an interesting finding here that shows a gender bias, right? So if you're hearing something described to you from the same sex, you're trusting it more. This is what this is showing. And it's also showing that um, the, um, the female voices are overall um, seeing a, you're, you're seeing a different reception of the, the trust based on the gender of the recipient. So the point here is that the best credibility for a review is if the gender of the voice matches the product gender and matches the listener gender, right? A male describing a male product to another male will get the highest trust. A female describing a female product to another female will get the highest trust. Um, and remember, I'm not breaking news here on psychology, right? Don't blame the messenger. This is well established in psychology. But what's surprising it that is, is that it's also working with synthetic speech. So this is something we have to be aware of that we are actually introducing significant gender biasing and significant gender uh, effects when we use text to speech. Okay, um, this has covered audio output all the way from noise uh, to melodies um, up to speech. Uh, and now let's look at audio input. Audio input means that the computer is listening, right? So we're using raw audio data to trigger something um, or control the system. That's the simplest level, right? If we go to back to the level of noise for audio input, um, then the computer doesn't understand exactly what's going on. We're just using everyday noise. So to clap, to turn on an interactive room, you know, to turn on a light, for example, or to monitor the noise level in this uh, multi-party video conference that we're having here right now uh, to switch to um, the, the right camera, basically. That is a typical thing that doesn't need to understand speech. Uh, it doesn't need to understand what's being said or not even who is speaking exactly. We're just looking at the microphone level in each uh, location and we're turning on, we're, we're zooming in on the video that has the highest noise. Um, a bit more refined, uh, some uh, you know conference cameras have built in microphone arrays and will automatically pen and tilt and zoom in on the person that is talking. So that's a little more involved, but it's still only listening to the noise level. It's trying to you know, find out where is the noise coming from, doing basically what we do in everyday listening uh, and to, to basically support interaction by uh, finding out who's speaking. Another thing that sometimes I wish my phone would be doing, it doesn't, um, you know, adjusting the ringer volume on your phone based on your environmental noise level. So if you're in a, a loud party, um, maybe your phone should you know, turn on its ringer a little more. And if you step out and you're in a quiet environment and maybe you don't need it so loud anymore. This is all fairly simple um, and it's used in commercial uh, applications today, right? I mean, even the example of noise canceling headphones or the, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, all the, um, these kinds of zoom-ins um, are built into commercial products today. And it's not very hard to do, right? It's, it's some basic signal processing, but you don't need to understand what's being, being, being said or something like this. Now, audio input for, uh, for, for the next level up melody is pretty weird um, because why would you want to sing to a computer, right? Um, but there's actually some applications. One is, of course, if, if what you're doing is uh, you're just recording music and uh, you know, you're playing an instrument or something like this, um, and you might be recording real audio data into a, you know, into multi-track sequencer software uh, in a studio, or you might even be recording synthetic um, audio information like MIDI, uh, which is a, a format that basically breaks down uh, music being played into which instrument plays it, how long, how loud does it play it, and what pitch does it play. Uh, very well established in electronic you know, synthesizers and in electronic instruments these days. Um, and um, audio input also can be used to actually uh, find things. So, you know, Shazam or um, you know, SoundHound, those kinds of things where you can hold it up to a, to a speaker, it will listen to the, 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 the music being played uh, and then it will find that song on, you know, Spotify or something. 
um, that works with full recorded music. And that's actually the easier thing because then I can just do basically matching of these, these waveforms to the original sound. But you can also have somebody hum the melody of the song uh, and then try to find that song uh, in the database. And that is actually a surprisingly difficult algorithmic problem. Um, what kind of challenges, uh, or how would you do that? How would you do, how would you write a system uh, that finds a song based on a, a melody that was being hummed? So I go like, <laughs> and you're supposed to find that song. Um, you would have to transcribe the notes from the melody so you couldn't directly compare the waveforms because the tempo and pitch would be different so this wouldn't work exactly um, then you have to transcribe the notes of every song that you want to compare to as well mm -hmm. right so you need to con you need to take the uh, the pitch sequence uh, that i sung and turn it into basically note values like a c sharp uh, C3 sharp or an, an A1 uh, or something like this. Um, and then determine, uh, and as you say, take the songs and find their pitch sequence as well. Uh, and that is sort of doable, right? We can see that. And if somebody maybe drops a note or so, we could still probably do some string uh, you know, matching uh, algorithms that, that, that can deal with small mistakes. The tricky thing is the speed, the duration. Because, I mean, there may be a lot of songs that have the same um, sequence of pitches as melody, but the rhythm might be very different, right? So, um, I don't know, you've got da-da-da-da, that's Beethoven, right? But dum-dum-dum-dum, that's something totally different, right? Nobody would say that was uh, Beethoven's fifth. Um, and how do you do that? Any ideas? Maybe you could ignore it at first and just just look at the notes at first, then look at all the possible examples and then make uh, like pattern matching what is closest to the one that was mm -hmm. presented. So so it definitely, it's a first good cut to just go by melody pitch sequence, sure. Um, and then you say you could maybe compare the uh, who's, who's sort of the closest match. And that's where it gets tricky though. Um, because, I mean, we already understood that uh, the melody, I won't sing this song in its original tune, uh, pitch, right? So we already need to do a search uh, that shifts my, my pattern around. I'm doing just a relative search, right? Starting from the start note. Um, and so once I found the right melody match, uh, you know, 10 songs that have the same melody, if I want to start matching the durations, uh, it's actually very tricky because I don't know what speed uh, this is being sung at. Uh, and what speed is being played at. So I might decide to maybe do some linear stretching of my uh, sequence to decide whether I get a good match with one or the other song. Um, but there is something else going on where a lot of people will apply what I, I like to call uh, sort of cognitive compression in pitch and duration. So people will typically sing long notes shorter than they should be singing them and short notes longer than they should be singing them, especially if they're not musically trained. So if they don't have, you know, a beat in their head and sing something along with the rhythm, they will just mangle that and basically compress everything down. Shorter notes become sh longer, longer notes become shorter, everything will have a smaller range. So that I'm not proposing a, a perfect algorithm here. I'm just saying this is a is an intricate uh, research problem that I'm sure you could throw some deep learning algorithms at uh, and probably get a very good result and you don't know how the system is actually doing it. Um, so that's an example for, for audio input on this next level of, of complexity. Um, and then there's finally uh, speech as an input modality, um, which we are all using these days with our audio assistants. Um, there are some of the ch some challenges, right? Um, we know that uh, the even the earliest, sorry, just for a second. Ah, okay. Even the earliest systems, um, you know, very early systems were, were speaker, highly speaker dependent, right? So you have typically the problem that a, a speech system can do very well if uh, it is 
trained and being exam and, and being tested on the same speaker. But if you go to a different speaker, then the system needs to be speaker independent. Um, and there's a lot of things that change between speakers, not just their pitch and their voice, but also their accent, uh, their intonation, how they stress things, how loud they tend to speak. All these things become, you make speech input, speech recognition hard. Uh, then the dependency on the vocabulary. So you can get pretty good speech recognition if you have a very limited vocabulary, but <clears throat> you will get much less convincing results if you try to build something that has an open-ended vocabulary that can basically understand everything that can come up in everyday discussions. Background noise is extremely critical. Uh, so building a system that works well in a lab where no other noise is present and the user is speaking into a microphone like I am now is a totally different situation from, you know, Sebastian standing at the bus stop talking to Siri and meanwhile the bus is pulling in and creating a lot of noise. Um, and even if we manage to detect the, uh, what is being spoken, so let's assume we manage to get a complete transcription, like you know, a good dictation service will write down what you spoke, right? Um, a good detection software, uh, a dictation software will write down what you speak into it to send a message, for example, but it still doesn't know what you're saying. It still has no idea of the semantics of what you're saying, but without understanding the semantics, it's really hard to correct for errors. And we are extremely good at semantics, right? The moment one person starts talking, we start building hypotheses of what they might be saying, where we take the current context into account, who the other person is, our mutual background, our mutual history, what we've talked about before when we met, last met, what's been going on, what they've been sending me via email. Um, all this gigantic context and background information is there when you listen to somebody else just saying a word to you in the hallway when you meet, when you meet them. And to become as good as people to actually understand what's going on, uh, you would have to have all that contextual information, which is incredibly hard. Um, then, of course, there's a lot of syntactic combinations for the same semantics. You know, you can say turn on light, but you can also turn, say, turn the lights on or uh, make it, you know, make it so that the lights are on or please flick that switch. I have a million ways of saying that Sebastian, and you'll know what I'm talking about. A computer is hard pressed to make out the right meaning of all these different syntactic descriptions. Then the next challenge, of course, and that's one that uh, actually um, AI has made a huge leaps forward in um, compared to earlier systems is understanding continuous speech, right? Uh, to, we as, as humans are, again, incredibly good at disambiguating blurred word boundaries and multiple semantics. Um, if you've heard anything about speech recognition, then you know um, this following sentence here. Uh, when I read that to you, you can interpret it in two ways how to recognize speech could either mean to go to town on you know, uh, the local uh, lake and destroy the beach, or I could have just said how to recognize speech, you know, how to detect spoken sequences. It sounds extremely similar. It means something extremely different. Um, and without having a lot of knowledge about the situation, the context, what's socially appropriate, et cetera, uh, that destroying beaches is not a nice thing to do. You know, how is a machine going to know what we're trying to say? So it's it's an it's an incredible challenge and it's an ongoing research challenge. And finally, um, it's an interesting observation that um, we are actually as humans we are pretty good at um, planning and problem solving in parallel to hand-eye coordination. So I can think about how I might open this pen. Uh, here while I'm holding it and handle it and fiddle with it, but talking to you at the same time, speaking while thinking is actually hard. So when I run into a bit of trouble here with my remote presentation um, and I try to solve that, you will find me going like, mm, uh, because I have a hard time continuing to speak uh, intelligible while I'm trying to solve these problems. All right, so that gets us to the 12 o'clock mark, and uh, we are actually on, on the mark for, we've wrapped up everything that we had to say about the audio realm of uh, multimodality. And next week, we will take a look at haptics, and then we will take a bit of a peek, um, you know, DIS2 style, at the technological challenges of doing these different kinds of multimodal systems. Thanks everybody for dialing in. And uh, we'll see you again next week.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.